Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our, uh, I think, our seventh week uh, of doing these services online. Um, it's still strange. Uh, it still doesn't seem right not to be able to see you all here in front of me. Um, but uh, I'm glad that you are uh, taking part in these services, and I'm glad that, that in this way, at least, we're able to connect with one another. We uh, just have a couple of announcements uh, for our young people, particularly. Uh, we have a Lighthouse Club Zoom party again at four o'clock this afternoon. Uh, you should have invitations for that, so please don't forget about that. And also another Zoom youth party at half past six uh, this evening. And Gareth's going to be hosting that, so uh, you should again have invitations for that. So please do uh, tune in for that half past six uh, on Zoom. We come to worship God together. Even though we're apart, uh, we know that as we meet like this virtually, we can still worship, we can still know God's presence with us in, in our homes. I'm going to read from Psalm 91 uh, as we begin. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress my God in whom I trust. We come to worship him as we sing together, Lord, I come before your throne of grace. for the future. 
And so, Father, we look to you. We ask that as we come to you in worship, you will speak to us by your word, by your spirit, wherever we are. Help us to know that the, the God of all creation, the God who has redeemed us, the God who is calling us to himself is with us right now and speaking into our hearts and our lives, encouraging us, challenging us, helping us uh, to take just one step further uh, into the future that you have for us. So we commit this time to you and ask that you would, uh, you would be to us all that we need as we worship you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to begin uh, a series over the next few weeks looking at the book of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, this is a book which talks to a church uh, in a difficult time, in a difficult place. Uh, and as I reflected over these last weeks about what to, to preach on following on from Ecclesiastes, I felt that this was the right place to go uh, because it does speak very much to our circumstances and where we can find hope and faith and joy and peace in the midst of difficult times. So our first reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 is going to be read for us by Holly McAllister. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 1 to 10. Paul, Silas and Timothy, to the church of Thessalonians in God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith your labour prompted by love and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord and you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell you how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Hello boys and girls, I hope you're all keeping well. This morning I'd like us to have a think about this word faith. Now one definition of faith is that faith is not being able to see but trusting the one who can. Okay, faith not being able to see but trusting the one who can. I thought to try to help us understand we could have a go at a little bit of a demonstration or an illustration of this faith today. So let's have a go at that for now. So Izzy's going to be my helper and we've been saying that faith is not being able to see but trusting the one who can. So Izzy I'm going to blindfold you. Okay. okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to blindfold you and then I'm going to make sure you can't see anything. And then you're going to have a go at this obstacle course. Now there's only a few things to go around. I just don't want to get prickled in that cactus. Because that would be okay. <laughs> All right. So we'll put the blindfold on first. Okay. And I want to make sure you can't see anything. How many fingers am I up? No idea. Okay, that's a good sign. Right, so all I want you to do is turn this way and I want you just to follow my instructions. Okay. Okay? So, Izzy, could you take four big steps forward, please? Good girl. Could you sidestep four? Stop. Take one wee step forward. Good girl. Just one. <laughs> then sidestep. Once more, good girl, and walk straight ahead, and one more, step and stop. Could you sidestep to the right this time, until I tell you to stop? Good girl, and could you walk forward please? Stop, and could you sidestep to the left? One, maybe another one, two, good girl, and could you do a... 180 degree turn, so turn right round, right round, and again, a wee bit more, a wee bit more, a wee bit more, good girl, and could you walk forward please? Good girl, keep going, keep walking, keep walking, keep walking, you're okay, keep walking, keep walking, and stop, 
Now I just want you to sit down. Don't feel anything. Just sit down and just trust me. Okay, you're okay. Ah, you <laughs> felt there. <laughs> well done, well done. You got to the seat. Well done. Thank you, Izzy. High five. You're going to get prickled. <laughs> So what is faith then? We said faith is not being able to see, but trusting the one who can. Izzy might have been blindfolded, but her faith or trust wasn't blind. She knew that I wouldn't do anything to harm her, that I wouldn't let anything bad happen to her. And so she knew that she could trust me and she could have faith in me. And so it is with God. You know, even though we may not be able to see God or know how things are going to work out, we can trust him. Because he can see all things, he knows all things, and he only wants the best for us. And so faith in God isn't blind faith. It's based on knowing him. And how can we know him? Well, we can read his word, which tells us all about him. Maybe even start at one of the Gospels and read about his son Jesus and how he lived. We can pray and talk to God, just like you would getting to know anybody, getting to know a new friend. You would spend time with them. That's how we can know God. And then we can begin to trust him. And that's how our faith in God can grow. So what is faith then? Let's try to remember this today. What is faith? Faith is not being able to see, but trusting the one who can our God can see all things. He knows all things. We can have faith in him. No matter what the future holds, when you have faith in God, you know that he is in control and you can be at peace and be at rest because your faith depends on him. I'm looking forward to seeing you this afternoon at the Zoom party. I hope it suits four o'clock today. If it suits you, I would love to see you then. Take care and God bless. A reminder of the faithful God that we worship and the one in whom we put all our trust is in our next song that we're going to sing together. It's the song Faithful One.
want to take a few minutes now just to pray for the needs of others. Let us all pray. Father, we gather here as your church and although we are separated by physical distance, we come together this morning in our homes, near and far, to worship you and to honour you as our Heavenly Father. We pray for our church family here at Ballygrenny. May we continue to keep in touch with one another to encourage and to give practical help to those who need it. During these unusual times, we pray for our minister Graham and our trainee deaconess Paula as they seek to reach out in different ways and minister to members of our congregation. Father, we pray that you will protect our church family, especially those who are working on the front line and also those who are older and some who are vulnerable. We want to remember our health and social care workers and for all who are providing essential services. Father, protect them. May they have the resources that they need to carry out their duties. We also pray for their physical and mental well-being. We want to pray for those who live in care homes and hospices. Keep them safe. And we pray that in your time and in your will, they will be able to meet with loved ones and friends once again. Father, we pray for those who are dying alone in a hospital or care home, who are missing their loved ones, perhaps not understanding what is going on. Draw near to them. We pray for those at home, worried about loved ones who are ill, Lord, strengthen them and comfort them. We remember those who are grieving through the loss of a family member or a friend. During these difficult times, when funerals are not what they would have wanted for their loved one, 
May they know your love and comfort in a very real way, through the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray for those in authority over us. We give thanks for the recovery of our Prime Minister. We pray for those in government, both at Westminster and at Stormont. We pray for our First and Deputy First Ministers. And we also pray for our Health Minister, Robin Swan, and those who advise him. Father, grant them wisdom and discernment as they seek ways of leading us through this pandemic. And we want to pray for our business leaders looking for ways to sustain employment, trying to make difficult decisions about their businesses. We also pray for workers who are concerned about their future and who have financial worries. Lord be with them as they face an uncertain future. We commit these prayers to you now, knowing that you will answer our prayers in accordance with your will. We pray in the name of your Son, our Saviour Jesus. Amen. Thanks to Marvin for leading us in our prayers for others. We're going to sing together again a great old hymn of faith and trust in God. A hymn which recognises our uh, dependence on him uh, and uh, our need for him. My faith looks up to thee.
Emotions are heightened. Boredom is the new default setting. And stress is showing. And of course, out there, beyond the four walls of our houses, life is tough. Life in hospitals is presenting daily challenges that would have been unthinkable just three months ago. Nursing and residential homes are at the front line of a desperate battle. Businesses are wondering about the future and whether they will be able to reopen after the lockdown. Social isolation is taking its toll on families. We keep on being reminded, as with every other situation in life, that this too will pass. But we find ourselves asking increasingly, okay, when? When will this pass? When will life return to something like normal? And the answer is, we just don't know. We don't even know what normality will look like after this. Right now, I guess, for a lot of you watching this, the part of normality you would love to see return more than any other is that part where you can come to this building to worship together again. I know that's the part I'm longing for. I want to be able to see your faces uh, in these pews in front of me and around me. I want to see our children run out to Lighthouse Club uh, and run back in again during the last hymn. I won't be able to enjoy a coffee after the service with you in the reception area. I long for that day to come as I know you do. But when we can't go to church, we can still be the church. And so while we wait for this time to pass, we need to ask ourselves now, how are we being the church? in these strange and difficult days. What kind of church is God calling us to be in these days? And how are we responding to that call? The church that Paul writes to in Thessalonica was experiencing difficult days. In fact, since its birth, this church had probably known nothing but difficult days. The church in Thessalonica was a young church. It was at uh, most five years old. Paul had planted the church and within a short space of time he had been forced to move on because of violent opposition. You can read about that in Acts 17. From there he had moved to Berea and then to Athens and finally he had got to Corinth where he was waiting for Silas and Timothy to come with news about the young churches in Philippi and Thessalonica. It was a suffering church. The violence and persecution in which the gospel had come to them <coughs> after, had continued after Paul had left. They're waiting for this time to pass. Perhaps they're wondering if it ever will. Paul has sent Timothy to them to encourage them because he knew that their afflictions were continuing. And yet despite everything, this is not a church in danger of collapse. Despite being a young and experienced church going through suffering, Paul saw the Thessalonian church as a model church. It was not a perfect church. They were still immature in matters of doctrine and of lifestyle. But even with these ongoing issues, Paul says they've become an example of faith, hope and love to all the believers throughout Macedonia and Achaia. So how can they be an example to us. How can we learn from them to be a church in a time of affliction? Well, there are four characteristics of this young church that every church should seek to model. First of all, we're told they are rooted in God. Paul addresses his letter to the Thessalonians in God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Their whole life comes from God. They are intimately, organically connected with God the Father and God the Son. They are actively seeking to live out a 
Jesus' command in John 15 to remain in him. They know he is the true vine, the true source of their full, abundant and everlasting life. And they know that they are called to be in Christ, but they also know that they are called to be where they are. They know that they are called to be in Thessalonica. They are located in a particular uh, place at a particular time in history. It's the city from which Paul and Silas had to flee by night for fear of the mob. It's the city where affliction and discrimination and persecution remain part of their everyday lives. This is where they are called to live out a life that is rooted in God. And if we are going to truly live out the Christian life, we need to know and understand that we are intimately and organically connected to God the Father and the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. But we also need to know that we are called to be the church in this area, at this time in the history of our community, our nation and our world. Our intimate connection with God empowers us to live out our Christian calling in the world, here and now. You and I are being called at the moment to live out our witness to Christ in the midst of a crisis unlike anything else in the last 100 years. I was speaking to someone last week on the phone who had lived through both the war years and the troubles in Bangor. And he cannot remember life ever being as restricted as it is at the moment. Add to that the fear that this virus has brought about for so many people, the sense of loneliness that so many are experiencing. And in the midst of all of this, we are called to live out our faith in Christ. The beginning of this lockdown period, uh, a short piece from the Lord of the Rings was circulating on social media, reflecting on the dark times that they're living in, uh, in the story of Lord of the Rings and on his role in those times, Frodo says to Gandalf the wizard, I wish it need not have happened in my time. So do I, said Gandalf, and so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for us to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. Followers of Jesus Christ are being called to live out our witness in these times. We didn't choose this. We wouldn't have chosen this. But what we can do is decide what we're going to do with the time given us. And our first decision will be to root ourselves in Him. And yes, that will mean maintaining our relationship with God through reading and studying and applying His Word. It will mean being constant in prayer. Yes, it will mean encouraging one another in fellowship and discipleship, even if we can only do it through technology or through a phone call. The church, which has an impact on these times in which we live, will be a church that is marked by faith and hope and love. These, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, are the only marks of Christianity that will remain or endure. And these, Paul says, were the marks of the Thessalonian church. Paul says that when he prays for the church of Thessalonica, he remembers your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. John Calvin says this is a brief definition of true Christianity. Our faith will be seen in our works. Those who have placed their faith in Christ for forgiveness of sin and reconciliation with God don't just sit back and do nothing and wait for heaven. Those who have been set free from slavery to sin and death by faith in the saving, saving death and resurrection of Jesus uh, are free now to serve the one true and living God. It is as we rest in faith on the past, completed work of Christ on the cross, 
that we are able to work for him in the here and now. The faith of the Thessalonians was evident in their deeds. People looked at what they did and they concluded that they, these people, had faith in Christ. When people look at what we do, what you and I do, when they look at how we respond to the current crisis, where do they conclude that we are putting our faith? What do we think we are placing our ultimate trust in? Do they think we're trusting in our bank account or our pension plan? Do they think we're putting our trust in our politicians? Or in our ability to, to socially distance or self-isolate? Do they see us putting our trust in our NHS? Ultimately. Or do they see our works and how we go about them and conclude that ultimately our faith, your faith, my faith is in none of those things, but rather in Jesus Christ. But people don't just see the faith of these Thessalonians at work, they also see the love of the Thessalonians in their works. You get a sense here that unlike the church in Corinth, this was the kind of church that people would have looked at and said, see how these Christians love one another. Love is the key hallmark of true Christian spirituality. By this Jesus said, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Without love, Paul says in Corinthians, everything that we do is like a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. John says that anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Love is hard work. Even loving our spouses and our families is hard work. And perhaps for some of you it's especially hard work in lockdown. But Jesus' kind of love takes that idea of hard work to a whole new level. He allowed himself to be whipped, beaten, spat on and jeered because he loved us, because of his love for us. He allowed himself to go through a mockery of a trial because he loved us. He allowed a crown of thorns to be placed on his head and six inch nails to be hammered into his wrists and ankles because he loved us. He was prepared to be abandoned by his father because he loved us. And because he did that for us, we work hard to show his love to others in our church, in our family, in our community. We love because he first loved us. Every time a disciple of Jesus puts on personal protective equipment and cares for that patient in hospital or that resident in care, they're showing the love of Christ. Every time a disciple of Jesus goes to work in a supermarket or a delivery van or in public transport, you are displaying the love of Christ. Every Christian teacher who goes into school to care for the children of key workers at the moment are showing the love of Christ to those children. Every time you go to a supermarket for a neighbour and at the same time drop something off for the food bank, you display the love of Christ. And of course there are plenty of people who are not Christians who are doing all these things at the moment. And we should love, give thanks and pray for them. We should encourage them and show them love and respect. And so you can show your love by thanking the shop worker or the delivery driver for their service at these times. You can let the hospital worker know that you're praying for them, whether that's somebody in our congregation or somebody else known to you. You can ask the care home worker if there's anything you can do for them. Show the love of Christ. 
to those who are hard pressed, who are worried, who are stressed. These Thessalonian deeds of faith and these labors of love are inspired by hope. Because of the death and resurrection of Christ, they have a hope which sustains them day after day after day. Through persecution, through hardship, through grief. In the movie uh, from a few years ago, The Martian, Matt Damon's character Mark Watney is an astronaut trapped alone on Mars after his crew leave him behind, presuming him to have been killed in a massive Martian storm. And it tells of how Watney plans his days and weeks and months, rationing his supplies, figuring out how to grow potatoes on Martian soil, planning for the day when he will be rescued, and putting up with the fact that the only music that has been left to him by his commander is disco music. Mark Watney has no guarantees. Even when his crew come back uh, in a rescue attempt, he's not certain that it will be successful. But for days and weeks, and months he keeps going in the hope of rescue. We have a guaranteed hope. We do not place our ultimate hope in the eradication of this virus. Nor do we place our hope in the global economy getting back on its feet again. We are not sustained by the hope of a return to normality or even a kinder, gentler version of the normality that we've left behind us. None of these hopes are guaranteed to us, even after this time passes. Our hope, your hope and mine, is in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This event guarantees for us an eternal life that is free from sorrow and sickness and sin and death. We can endure griefs, trials, hardships, difficulties, discouragements, defeats in the knowledge that the ultimate victory has been won at the cross and in the empty tomb. This victory is ours to share. Whatever you're going through right now, and however you're feeling in the midst of this crisis, this hope is yours through faith in Christ. God will not let you go. If you have trusted him, if you are trusting him, however feebly you might be trusting him, he has you. And once he has you, he does not let you go. Not ever. He will hold you fast. So like the Thessalonians, let your life in difficult times be shaped by the gospel. When Paul shared the message of Jesus in Thessalonica, it came, he said, not just with words, but with power. Lives were transformed by the Holy Spirit as people recognized their sin and rebellion and turned to Christ for grace and forgiveness. And they received this good news with sheer joy. And that joy of the gospel rang out from them. There was no danger that the message of the gospel ringing out from the church in Thessalonica would fall silent just because times were difficult. They would take it with them everywhere. They would share it with everyone. They would speak of it all the time. And people would see it impacting on their lives. They would declare and demonstrate the good news of Jesus Christ for all to hear and see. So if you want to demonstrate faith in difficult times, root yourselves firmly in God and in Christ by the power of the Spirit. Trust in the one who holds you fast. Love in the name of the one who loved you and gave himself for you. Put your hope in the guarantee that the Holy Spirit has placed in your heart. Let the gospel of Jesus shape you and fill you with his joy as you live out your faith in him.
Let's pray. Father God, in these challenging and difficult times, give us the faith that we need, that will be seen in our works, that will be seen in our labours of love, that will be demonstrated in the hope that we profess in you. Give us that faith, we pray. Help us to put our trust entirely in you and to take each day as you give it to us as an opportunity to love and serve you and to share your love with others. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to close our service as we sing a hymn, another one which may be new to some folks, but which a lot of you will know. Um, he will hold me fast.
and will bless one another with the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore.